All right. Thanks for uh, bearing with me, Walt. Sometimes this stuff gets a little hairy, you know. All right, we're live, Walt. Hey. We're live. Okay, so hey, uh, I'm going to go ahead and play this clip. Uh, uh, go ahead. I'm going to admit my uh, cohort here. All right, I'm going to play the clip, okay? Sounds good. All right. Uh-oh, what happened? He's, can you hear it? Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Walt Johnson. Hey, Walt, did, did, that, did everybody hear that? I couldn't really hear that. The, the, the uh, sound was kind of weird on that, but yeah, that was recorded, it, that was recorded in London. Oh, uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, that's uh, that's actually the first time I've ever heard you. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for uh, joining our webinar today. And today's special guest is the incomparable Mr. Walt Johnson. Walt has had a career that only uh, we only dream of, a lot of us have only dream of having. And Walt, thank you so much for taking time out of your day no, to join us. Not a problem, I'm, I'm happy to be here and I, I'd love to help some young players out and just to lend a helping hand. And because, you know, these are this, those players are our future. You know, we have to keep that trumpet going. Yeah. The spirit of the trumpet. You're absolutely right. And uh, you know, Walt, I mean, I, I really, I agree with you 100%. And the thing is, is I'm um, I, I'm really fortunate to to you know have worked to have you actually come and uh, give a clinic here in Arizona, and uh, you know now with this webinar, uh, thank you again so much. So for some of you who don't know, Walt Walt has um, worked with the best in the business. Uh, I mean, Walt, if you don't mind, I'm just gonna brag on you a little bit. Uh, uh oh, name drop. <laughs> don't, forget, don't forget Trini Lopez. All right, gotcha. Uh, we're actually uh, Elvis has worked with Frank Sinatra, uh, Louis Belson. Uh, he's Count Basie. He's worked with Elvis Presley. He's worked with Barbara Streisand. He's worked with, I mean, Henry Mancini. He's worked with anybody who's anybody uh, in the business. Walt has worked for. And so, Walt, again, thank you so much for joining us. I'd like to start this webinar by uh, asking a few questions, if it's cool, and then we'll open it up Great. to some questions from uh, everybody else. Um, so, Walt, why don't you go ahead and tell us how you got um, how you got the horn in your hand? Who put who put the trumpet in your hand? Well, this guy came around to our schools. His name was Mr. Johnson, you know, and he uh, he demonstrated all the the instruments. He could play them all. He played trombone, played clarinet, and sax, and but when he played that trumpet, I said, that's, that's the one. Because I think it's because it's the loudest, you know, probably. But that was it. And, uh, and I started taking lessons. And, and I was nine years old and uh, developed in high school. And I was, uh, the thing that I wanted to actually talk about is in early school, the competition. Okay. You know, what decides who's the first trumpet player? Okay. You know, is it always the guy that plays the highest and the loudest? Or is it the guy that plays with the most authority? It, or, you know, what decides if you're a band director and you have to decide between like four guys, 
Yeah. Which one is going to play the, what, what makes you decide? That's a good question, I think. Yeah. And a lot of times it goes to the guy that can play the highest, you know, and it seems like, you know, even Cat Anderson, when he was 14, he, he noticed that everybody played better than him. So he developed something that he developed that high range thing and he developed right. a way to build his chops. And he, of course, you no, know, everybody knows that he was the greatest of all time. I know player, man, but uh, yeah. And you know, you're right. I, I mean, I, I, I tell this story to my students a lot, you know, I mean, when I was a kid, I had trouble reading. Reading was very challenging for me. And I think I, um, it was, but I had chops. So I was able to skate by because of my chops. Now that's not an excuse, you know, to, for everyone to not read or not learn how to play musically or this, that, and the other. But, you know, you're right. Some band directors do view that as, okay, well, who, who can, who's the strongest, I guess, the strongest player. Strongest, with most authority, uh, the best style, you know, the, but, yeah. but uh, if there's a three page chart and you're playing in a big band and the, 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 the guy that wrote it put a high F or F sharp on the end, he wants to hear that and you've got to have something. So that's what I, I developed this high gear, low gear method that uh, I want to talk about later that I wrote this book about that I wrote a couple of books about it now. And it, it has helped a, a lot of young players get this, get over that bump of uh, not being able to play. And so it's like a ceiling you hit. Anyway, going back to, uh, to the, uh, my start, I played with, uh, I, I was in college. I went to LA city college and uh, there was a lot of good players there from Hollywood. And I guess uh, they needed a lead trumpet player for Cy Zentner's band. The guy had uh, cyst on his gum and he couldn't play. So they, they called me. I was playing lead at the, in LA City College. And uh, before I knew it, I was found myself uh, with the first book in Cy's band. And I was on the road with him for eight months and ended up getting drafted in the army. And then I spent a, a year at Fort Ord in the band and a year in Vietnam. Oh, wow. Was, kind of interesting you know but I did have my trumpet there I played a lot of taps but I also uh, had to pull duty and you know guard duty and all that but eh, it was there's one funny story when I was pl practicing out on the green line and I kept hitting these high notes and the everybody all these natives were there out there and they went Ooh, you know and I hit a high note there I said said to this one that spoke English I said oh you guys must really like high notes he goes, no, you turn so red. <laughs> that was at least they're I, honest, right? At least they're honest. Yeah, but you know, it's funny. But uh, uh, but I, I, I think that's it's important that that trumpet players get along. And we, you know, Lanny Morgan, a long time time ago, told me, and he's a good friend, right? He was Maynard's lead alto player. He told me, he says, "Oh, you trumpeters, you all hate each other," and we don't. But I know what he's talking about. There's an inner competition that's created in school or something. Right. That, and, and I don't know if it's who hits the highest, or who plays the fastest jazz, or who plays the, the loudest lead, or who can play. But I think it's it should be who's the musical chameleon, who can do it all. You know, a jack of all, master of a few. That's what I believe. And it's you got to be good, really good at something. And, and be specialized in one type of playing. Yeah, I mean, so let me ask you a question. When, um, when let's 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 dial back a little bit. And um, and uh, one thing I I wanted to uh, to ask you is that let's talk about your big break. Let's talk about a lot of people don't know about you working with Cy and how that was kind of you when you when we talk. You say that was kind of like your big break, right? That was like you know your 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 you're you're in uh, as far as the Las Vegas doing the shows there. So why don't you talk a little bit about side? What was that like? How did you get on the band? And uh, can you like can you tell us like what did you learn from that? Well, I mean, kind of the same thing. The very first night on the on the band, uh, we played at uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base, and I I was making clams left and right, you know. And, and but there was a solo in Ebb Tide went up to a high G ba, ba, da, ba, da, da, and I, I hit it. And right after that break, he came up to me and the first question he asked me, how are you with the draft? And I said, well, I'm one A. Ah, oh, don't worry, we'll get you out. So it, it worked for about eight months, but they caught up to me. Um, and, uh, but when you get out of the army, you're supposed to get your job back. 
you yeah. know, that you had. Well, you, so I was with Cy Zender's band when I was drafted. Right. So I get out of the army two years later and I drive to Las Vegas where he was the conductor at the Follies Berger. And I went up to him and I said, hey, I'm back, you know. And he said, well, I'm happy with the trumpets I have now. So, oh, <laughs> and, uh, but he did give me two weeks in the blue room with Julie London and, uh, and Cy Zentner's band. And I, I played up there for two weeks and, you know, uh, he featured me on a few things and I got some offers. And one of those offers was the Landmark House Band, which I accepted and I went, I was there for a year and then went to Haig's Relief Band, which was a, a band that played on the off nights. You had to sight read every night. And that got me in with a lot of different people and including uh, Joe Gershio, and, yeah. uh, who was uh, Elvis's conductor and Wayne Newton. I played for him for quite a while. And um, Elvis and uh, that, that got me on the Elvis gig when uh, I, I wasn't doing Wayne Newton. I was playing second with Elvis next to Pat Houston, yeah, his, his lead player, who died in a car crash. Oh, wow. So when that happened, I called uh, Joe Gershio up and I said, hey, would you consider using me for the lead chair? He goes, ah, oh, you'll never quit Wayne Newton. And I did. I quit Wayne Newton and, and joined Elvis as the lead player. It was a... Uh, How'd you... Yeah. Let me ask you a question. So let's, like, if you, if you don't... Because I know I'm, I'm getting a bunch of questions here, but I mean, I'm trying to answer all these. Think, let's let's ask let me ask you a question so what did it take well when you were in like can you tell us what it was like during the heyday of vegas in like you know late 60s 70s you just got out of vietnam and you're you're, you're playing with all these acts chop wise mental wise what was it like what did it take to be a success during that time well you know there was so many working musicians there in 19. 19- 70 when I got there um, and every hotel had they, the union required they have a, um, a house band which was like three or four trumpets three or four trombones five saxes I mean it was every you had your choice of what hotel to work at pretty much it was like great I got five offers one was the dunes and you know one was to go with Paul Anka and I got all these these offers but I took the landmark because it was steady in town you know it was a steady gig and I had worked my way up to first trumpet there. I was actually third trumpet and I became first trumpet. That's a long story, but. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm saying like, was the, I mean, I, I mean, cause you know, I, for guys that, that have not lived through that, I mean, we do, we all do shows, but to do five or six shows a day, seven days a week or six days a week. I mean, and to be a success, I'm quite sure like some of it was kind of grueling because you had to read, you had to read really well. And you, I mean, I mean, did it? Oh, you know, the production you, you probably, shows were the production shows were ridiculous. You know, yeah. you didn't uh, you didn't get uh, good better chops necessarily. You just learned how to play on sore lips. You know, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I remember that Dune show. It ru- ruined a, quite a few trumpet players. They had to go surgery and oh wow, yeah, it's uh, that Dune show. I crazy. Uh, I'm glad I didn't have to do that again. It's like a circus, you know. Yeah. And, and no gratis gratification. You're up in a little booth and you're blowing r- real hard and the, the band is playing real hard and the crowd, they, they could just be a recording. They don't care. Oh. <laughs> so let me ask you this, like, again, because I've heard of a lot of players in those shows blowing out their chops. You know, I'm, I've heard it time and time again. And I, apparently it's becoming a thing where, but let me ask you, I'm sure you, you've encountered guys that you sat next to that, you know, they, they popped it. I mean, what kept you, did you become a smarter player and say, okay, I can't, I, I, I need to, I need to be able to, to, to be able to do this for the next coming weeks. My life depends on it. What did you do in order to, you know, did you become like what the, a lot of pros say a smarter player? Yeah. You have to become honestly a business trumpet player. Yeah. You know, just get the note out and right into the microphone and uh, with me, I had this, I have a second embouchure that I go to that, that saves me. You know, if I didn't have that, I, I swear I wouldn't be able to, to have landed any of these jobs. You know, so it's just, it's, it's like you bring, bring your lip in and create a different higher pitch vibration. And it just, it's like shifting gears. Um, this 
method I, I used. And it was taught to me by Charlie Turner in Las Vegas. After I got back from Vietnam, he saw what I was doing. He said, do it a little more, you know, and that's, that's what, where that happened. Okay. So, yeah. And then, so why don't you, Hey, you, you have like a million stories, which I thought is, is, is great. What did working those shows in Vegas, how did that prep you like for Elvis? How did that prep you for Paul Inca? How did that, like, what was it about doing them shows that uh, really prepped you for the big time? When, per well, se- you know, Vegas is, the, the shows are exciting, you know, yeah. uh, you know, like all stops pulled out, you know, and that, that's what, that's what I, I you know, when they do that 2001, it's like definitely uh, power, your power player. So uh, Vegas uh, was kind of lended to the way I thought trumpet should be, like that God, Comrade Gozzo style lead playing, blowing out, and uh, and Pat Houston certainly was a powerhouse player. And they're, they're, I mean, Vegas had a lot of really Tommy Perello, really good trumpet players in in, uh, in Las Vegas. And, well, during like I guess during when you were there, I mean, there there was every the who's who of trumpet players was there. You know, Rick Baptist, Charlie, I mean, Finley, all, the, all those yeah, guys, Dr. right? Finley, they all uh, started there and went to, to L.A., the Rick Baptist. Absolutely. Yeah, they're, it was a good place to get started. And the same conductors that worked in the studios in L.A. worked and, and conducted for different acts. And those like Artie Butler and yeah. uh, different people like that. Yeah. So, so it was, uh, well, what happened was when I when Elvis died, um, my friend who had played French horn yeah. with uh, with Wayne Newton, Gus Klein, his father is Manny Klein, the oh, famous wow. player. Trouble, right? and, and, and his wife was contractor at Aaron Spelling and at Columbia Pictures, uh, Marion Spell, uh, Marion Klein. So um, he had me come over to his father, to Manny's house, and Manny kind of had this audition. It was the Beethoven trio. And it was funny, they, they pass you the third part. You're thinking, oh, good, I just, I'm playing the third. I'm glad I'm not playing the first. But the third part is the hardest part. <laughs> it's, got a, it's got a lick in there. It's a octave, octave jump. And they, they all wait for that. They lay, and, and I think it was me, Alan Bazzuti, and Manny playing it. When, oh, when wow. they so they're playing first and second, and they're waiting. <laughs> and of, course, of course, I watched it. You know, they laughed. They let but up, 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 you know, they, they, they left. Thought that the third part was going to be fine, right? Yeah, that was, but that was the Manny Klein audition. Oh, wow. And, and I guess I passed it because Manny whispered into Marion's ear, get Walt a TV show. Cause he's, you know, he's, he's just in town, new in town. Elvis died. And, you know, and so, uh, can we talk about first TV show was the San Pedro Beach Bums. Okay. And the other trumpet player on there was Paul Salvo and Mark Snow was the, uh, the the composer. The thing about it, when you go and you do those studio gigs, the same players that do the other studio gigs, the big calls and the movies and stuff, they're in there too. Yeah. So you kind of schmooze with them, you get to know them and the socializing brings your connections and they, they get to know you and they like your playing, you play in tune, you play the right note at the right time, get along with everybody. And that's the way you, you get calls that's that's how it happened and i started getting i had one tv show a week then two and at one time i had nine tv shows a week oh wow i mean that was like the heyday yeah so let me ask you a question again let's let's i, I again i'm getting questions from right again walt just bear with me here i'm trying to do like 14 things at once <laughs> so well a lot of us especially people who don't know what was it like to work with with Elvis, like one of the greatest, well, greatest entertainers of our time, Elvis Presley. You know, what was his show like? What was his gig like? What was his book like? Like, what was it, what was he like? It, there was, well, he was he was a nice guy, okay. very, and and he, he was kind of shy a little bit, but you know, funny. You know, like like practical jokes, and you know, he was like very generous to the band, and and his shows. You've never seen anything like this. I mean, girls running up the aisle, throwing themselves at him, just going crazy, screaming, and just like hysteria. There's never been anything like that ever. I mean, I don't know. I don't think uh, Sinatra ever had that kind of following, but but Elvis, it was. Uh, and then, well, <laughs> one funny thing about it is when we were playing the show, 
And here people have bought their tickets months in advance and they're waiting for Elvis to come out. They're all Elvis fans. And the lights come down and they go, now, ladies and gentlemen, from Las Vegas, timpani, the hot Hilton horns. And people, what? And we play Beethoven Swift. And uh, and they were like, oh man, we want Elvis to come out. But he didn't come out till after the comedian and the intermission. So, but it was always, but I always, and I still have the t shirt that says Hot Heels and Horns. Yeah. It's like I could never wear it. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, what was his book like? Like, what was his? Well, it, 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 it a lot of vamps, you know, ba -da -ba, ba -da -ba, vamp till dead, you know. <laughs> vamp till dead. <laughs> yeah, it was like, you know, so we figured out a way to spell each other, like, we play twice, then they play twice, and then play twice. We keep up, you know. But uh, yeah, it was at times it was gruesome, you know, like grueling. It had people didn't notice, but uh, how how hard that that music was. But it, it had some good good things in it. You know? So what, like, so I mean, you said you talk about Pat Houston and how I mean I've heard stories about him how he was a plumber, at actually he was a plumber. That was his like his gig. And uh, but you know he was also an amazing trumpet player, and uh, but the only guy he he claimed he never practiced, you know, and he'd get to the gig, and I I'd see him play, and and I I I could notice they what did he say if you don't practice other musicians notice well I can notice that he just a slight but what a amazing player he was that he could he could actually get through the book without practicing oh. I could never do that. Yeah, I mean, he just picked it up. He just took it out of the case. He was one of those really uh, two pounds of ground round meat and potatoes type player. You know? Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, like I said, I, I think you heard me say, or you, I heard you say that, you know, again, his, his his advocation was, you know, being a plumber, but he also made more money doing plumbing than he did yeah. as a trumpet player. Well, I had, that's that's where we really got to know each other. I had him over my house one time to fix my garbage disposal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I mean, the message out there is, yeah, the message out there is, you know, you can do other things, and trumpet playing is just, you know, you know I mean, it, you can also do other things to make money. But uh, so let's after. So let me ask you, what was your most memorable of uh, moment with Elvis? Uh, I'd say that when we played uh, two weeks after the movie Rocky, oh wow, uh, okay, had come out. We played at the Spectrum in Philadelphia, and I played Maynard Ferguson's theme from Rocky. And when I when we went into the dun, da, da, dun, da, 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 you know when we went into the theme, the crowd, I was about twenty five thousand people. They just came unglued, and it was like a, you know I still remember that that <laughs> that feeling wow. of like wow. you know I, yeah, and they weren't I don't know they weren't applauding for me. They were applauding for Rocky, but. Still, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you, you told me a story that um, uh, I think was it you that was telling me the story that you were his driver, Elvis. You drove him around. Was that you? That you drove him around. No, that was Joe Walsh. Joe Walsh. Okay. Drove, him, drove yeah. me to hometown. But uh, uh, I went to uh, after we finished the Live from Memphis album, we went over to his house, right. and uh, he handed us all checks. He handed us me a check for five hundred and shook my hand and thank me and uh, you know I, I got to tour the house it was good but uh my I, one conversation i had with elvis was he was we we're backstage and he he, he looked at his watch and he looked back and he says well i gotta go put on my clown suit <laughs> <laughs> so i i like that they call it the clown suit. you know that the, that suit he wore yeah i, I mean um so so uh, I mean, unfortunately, the king passes, you know, and uh, you like you said, and then you're like, well, he wasn't supposed to die. <laughs> yeah, I'm like you know, yeah, we were just having fun, you know. Yeah. yeah. And so you, you move out to L.A. and you said Manny Klein got you got you started in the in the L.A. studios, right? And, and uh, but and you know the thing is, you had the chops, you had the reading chops for doing all the shows. Uh, so uh, let. Can you talk, can you walk us through your first real big studio thing? And then were you, were you scared? Were you, were you just like whatever? Or I mean, a lot of people don't know what it's like in that, during that time when there was so many, like there are now, so many great players and so many where it's do or die. 
you know? Well, you get your chance. Everybody gets their chance, you know, but I, you know, it's, they say about studio work, it's 99% boredom, 1% sheer terror. <laughs> and you get your, you get your sheer, sheer, everybody gets their sheer terror chance you know, eventually. But I remember uh, the, the most thing that stands out on those TV films, when they fade into a scene, you hear the orchestra fading out, a diminuendo. And I know when I lived in Las Vegas, it's like, what's a diminuendo? You know, like, you know, it's, it's like, you know, it's like when you turn the water faucet down or when you turn the radio down, you turn it too far, you turn it off, you know? And that's what a trumpet is. I had to learn how to do diminuendos because they don't dial it down. They expect you to dial it down. And it's very noticeable when you fall off the note or you go, oh, oh, or something, you know, it's like, try to try, try the menuendo, start triple four day and then come down to pianissimo. It's oh, just, wow. it's, that's one of the hardest things that I admire people like Malcolm McNabb and uh, people that, that I sat next to that, that just did it naturally. And I even asked them, hey, how do you do that? Yeah, you practice, you know. <laughs> really? Practice? Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I had to, I had to learn how to do dominuendos. So, and, and you can do it like a little bit fading away from the microphone, only so much, you know, a little bit, you know. So, so let me ask you a question. So you're, you're again, you're, you're, this is your bread and butter, man. You're running into every Dane player under the, under the, you know, <laughs> under the moon. I mean, I know, I, I know, I mean, we can talk forever about all the credits you've done. Can you tell us some of the memorable studio moments that you had that you're like, like you even told me you did the A team, you did, uh, you know, you did all these great shows that you know that we all know. You did the Paramount thing, bum, 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 you know. I mean, can you give us some of the like most memorable times in the, in the studios that that kind of really stick out? Well, I, you know, I, I we had a lot of uh, laughs during the uh, Naked Gun movie. You know, because uh, they showed the, the scene, and uh, and another one was planes, trains, and automobiles. When they, when they, he was in the devil. He looked like the devil. He says, "Hey, you're going the wrong way." I mean, they showed all those scenes to us while we were scoring those things, and we just had a had a wonderful time uh, laughing at those those scenes. It's just it was a great experience, and uh, yeah. But I, I know that I I posted the other day on Facebook the uh, me playing the mariachi solo uh behind um uh, oj simpson you know? oh yeah 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 but, <laughs> and and i had they asked me to do a cadenza and i i mean I, I was showing off i had good chops in those days i played up to a double high b and they they said no that that's impossible we don't want to play that that's too much so they just had me end on the b and the and the step you know just kind of with some vibrato you know so that was, that was <laughs> it was cool you know I, I don't I'm not in favor of OJ so much, but yeah. <laughs> you were telling me on especially on that naked gun uh scoring session, that was at seven o'clock in the morning. Actually, yeah, eight o'clock. Yeah. Eight o'clock, yeah, eight o'clock in the morning. Um I can picture I can't remember what was where it was, but I can picture it. And I do remember that uh they, they made about three or four takes of that same thing kept doing it oh no we need another one because it didn't fit the picture and the end credits went on and on and on <laughs> if you watch that it's like and if i didn't have that high gear thing happening i, I would have been sunk but that's that's really one of the hardest things ever yeah, yeah. I, I mean that theme that theme is brutal i mean i know i can only do it like twice through and then i'm gone <laughs> you know that theme is brutal man uh, yeah so, so it was, it was uh, i believe it was me um uh, bob finley rick baptist and oscar Bashir. oh wow now was is it? oscar is oscar still in la i haven't seen him uh, in, in years i don't know I, okay now well you did the academy awards I, didn't you I did the Academy Awards twice with uh, Henry Mancini back in the early 80s. Can you tell us what that was like? Uh, boy, is that, that was like, you got to be on your toes the whole time. You know, yeah. you, you're, uh, you got all these uh, possible ones that could win. You've got all the music up in front of you and then they announce the winner and you just got to go right to it. You know, you got the headphones on and it's like, talk about uh, sheer terror. 99% <laughs> quarter, that's, 
that was all sheer terror. It, it, but a lot of it was pre-record and it was really nice, but uh, but definitely I wasn't playing lead. Graham Young was was playing uh, playing lead. I was playing second on those. And uh, Al Aaron's and I can't remember who else, but yeah. So so for a lot of the students out there and and, and uh, you know, for people that don't know. What was uh, someone in your position? I'm not going to ask you what you made, but sometimes what was what would somebody in your position make during that time at a studio session? What was like what was like the going rate at that time? I think it was like uh, about flat scale, was like 370 or something like that, 378 for uh, for three hours, maybe. Mm -hmm. And then uh, yeah, flugelhorn double was 50 percent more. So. It's worth it to get have flugelhorn. I used to have a sticker I put on my trumpet case. Would you like to hear it on flugel? <laughs> because I, even if they just hear it, then you get the you get the money. Oh, but, you do. That's awesome. But there's a there's a there's a famous story about uh, Shorty Chiraca. Who is it? Uh, somebody asking Nelson Riddle if if he'd like to uh, hear it on flugelhorn. He said, "Oh, you got him." He's and they go, oh yeah, yeah, we got them. Well, well shove it up your. <laughs> did you? Yeah, I, I take. You're just it, trying to get more money. <laughs> uh, what was Henry again? What was Henry Mancini like? A lot of people don't really talk about what he was like. You know, he was an angel, a beautiful guy, and very, very talented. You know, of course, uh, and uh, he was one of the guys. He came back and hung with us. You know, and when we we're coming back, I traveled with him for a good while while his Cecil was um, having an append appendectomy. So uh, that was his regular trumpet player. Oh, wow. But uh, yeah, no, he was, uh, he, he uh, actually, when he heard my tape, I, I sent out a demo tape and that's how I got the gig. Mm -hmm. And he, he heard it and he had, he used to use Bud Brisboy, but he, he heard me playing the high notes. So there we go again, high notes get the tension and make people's ears perk up a little bit, I guess. <laughs> you know, I mean, well, I, I don't know. That's that is that a thing amongst trumpet players? Would you say the high note thing is? Well, it's, yeah, it's, it, it's definitely impressive. But it's it's like anything. High notes are in my, and for what I'm seeing from a lot of educators out there, a lot of people, high notes are just it's like hot sauce. How much do you want? You know, and uh, you know the uh, one of the things I really liked about you, Walt, when I heard you play, is that you know. Yeah, you you have the power. You, I mean, you you have the you have the you have the sizzle. You have the, I mean, when I heard you do that tribute to Maynard thing last year, it was amazing. I sat five feet away from you, and uh, but the thing is, is you do it with finesse as well, you know. And that's well, you know, I mean, that's one thing we should talk about is that music is a language, yeah. you know, and and people give a speech, you know, and they say the same words but they say it differently and they get you, but you know, you can. When you when you speak the language called music, that's the first thing. You, I, I can tell if a guy's got that language, music language, if he plays a march. You know, it's just that bum, bum, but it gets at that sort of a spirit that yeah. you get, or or there's, but that makes a difference between different players. Right. You know, what, what they speak, how they speak the language. So, would you say that? I mean, because I've always I've asked a lot of studio guys that what separates this the this tier from this tier and i've heard things like well it's pitch it's the way it's what you can sound like on a dime you know uh it's 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 a, it's a bunch of those things so like i think you're right i think you hit onto it in studios yeah. it's perfection right you know you know there, there there's uh you're only as good as your last clam or you're only as good as your next clam you know you yeah. don't want to make any clams you know so I, I just, uh, you, it's very embarrassing to make mistakes in the studio. They, they, they stop everything, you know, and they're not going to, they're not going to punch it in. You think, oh, that was, no, 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 oh, no, 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 that. So, um, now you're, okay, so you're, again, you're working in LA, you're, you're doing all these, then you get a call from Louis Belson. Tell me what Louis was like. You know, Louis for, for me. Louis to me was like a famous musician should be nice to everybody, talk to everybody like they've been a friend of his for their whole life. And he was just, he was a sweetheart. You know, I, I, I admired him and uh, um, 
I think he was just the opposite of what Buddy Rich was like, you know, from the stories I've heard. He was, yeah. Buddy Rich was not nice and Louis yeah. was nice. But yeah, um, I traveled with, to London with him. I traveled um, all over the United States and his and with his wife, Pearl Bailey, one time. That was fun. So yeah. what was the book like? Well, the book was, uh, you've heard the, the charts, but yeah. when I first got on the band, it was Bobby Shue as lead. Oh. Um, Blue Mitchell wow. and uh, Cat Anderson, and Frank Zabo, and myself. Uh, was, no pressure there, Walt. <laughs> yeah, but then, then it's kind of like Cat Anderson. I, I forget what happened, but I found myself playing his book, and I had to do that evolution of the blues. And one time I had to do it at Disneyland when Cat was out front. Oh, wow. Yeah, that was weird. Then I can't was out front. I had to go play that same solo with it. And he came back, he complimented me. But it was kind of uh, uh, yeah, well, yeah, you know, it's like he, he was a funny cat. <laughs> and uh so did you tell me that you lived like right next door to Cat or really close to no, him? No, no, uh Freddie Hubbard. Freddie Hubbard, Freddie Hubbard. Yeah. Now what was he like as a neighbor? Did you guys like hang out? Like I wish, I wish we did. No, but he, he didn't he didn't really schmooze. I didn't get to know him till till later. Yeah, yeah. When we play, played the uh, mon the uh, jazz festival, uh, how the Playboy Jazz Festival, it was me in the middle, Clark Terry, Freddie Hubbard. That oh, was. Wow. I mean, how how about a name drop on that one? I got <laughs> pictures to prove it, but that was, and I was funny. I I went down front and I played a solo on Sunny Side of the Street, and then yeah. I hit some high R's, double D's or something, and Freddie. When he went down to play his solo, he he hit some high notes and he looks back at me like, "Yeah, <laughs> you know, he's like, it's funny." Pretty humble. What 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 are some questions we're getting here? So I got I got some questions. I but the, before we get to that, can I can I touch on one more point? Sure. Everyone's got, everyone wants to know this. What was it like working with Frank? You know, you had to kind of watch your P's and Q's. With him when i first got the, the gig i was kind of warned you know he may not like your cologne so don't get too close to him you know like how did you get the gig how did you get the gig uh they they asked if uh, i got a call from al ramsey who had that was a contractor at the golden nugget when frank was coming in there and they asked if i could hit the b flat in uh, luck be a lady so there we go again the high note thing yeah. you know and i said sure and uh they never called it up <laughs> the whole time I was there, but I was ready to play it. But it, it was that was in 1984. Okay. You know? and, and then I played, and then um, off and on he he used me on the West Coast, and, and he was going through some different things in, in those days. So uh, they used Tony Garuso on the on the in New York right. and different players, and then he used um, me out west for for a few years, and then uh, but. Uh, the pressure was on. I, I actually, my connection was Irv Kotler, the drummer. He liked the way I played, and I believe even in a big band, when you're a lead trumpet, you got to be glued to the drummer. I mean, when his stick comes down, you're back. You're right there, and that's what Irv liked that about me. And, and he took. So I asked him one time. I said, "Does does Frank like the way I play?" He goes, "Yeah." He said, "He's got ears. He's got eyes," and and I know one time I I flubbed a note in "Luck Be a Lady." They yeah. call her lady luck, and I missed the high E flat. And yeah. Sinatra turns around. He goes, "You sure about that?" <laughs> so Whew, that was a tough one, man. I was like, "Oh, oh. well, maybe I could become a professional golfer or something." <laughs> you know, one of the things that really uh, that you know, I mean, like I, I could listen to your stories for days, man. But uh, one of the things I always ask you is about you know some of us that would think is the dream gig remember we you talked oh about that. can you uh can you tell everybody about the yeah well you know i'll try to say, tell the quick you know I, I we show up and it's at uh, radio city music hall and it's uh count basie's band count basie was already gone and uh count basie's band with frank sinatra playing frank sinatra's book and i was playing lead trumpet i just and the rest of the band was basing yeah and the guy that was sitting next to me was just playing too loud. I'd go, ba, ba, da, ba, 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 da, 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 you know, just playing the like some nice figure. And he'd be, ba, ba, 
pa da pa pa pa. So for four days out of the week, I was just like, what am I going to do? So I, I, I went to him. I said, hey, is there a loving way I could ask you to play under me? Oh, man, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I always play lead, you know, but yeah. it's just, you know, it's, it's that that made it a miserable gig, really. Oh, I, I, yeah. So, well, you know, it, it can ruin your, you know, that, that's happened with Sinatra. They, they're so happy that they're playing the Sinatra book sometimes that they wanted. This is their chance to show off that they can show that they play. But no, you to get to win the lead player's favor, play under him, show respect, praise like him, play the same way he plays. Uh -huh. The same dynamics and and I, I even like i break the ice when i show up to like like because with the sinatra and with the elvis thing i showed up i actually play with hundreds of different trumpet sections yeah. you know I, I try to break the ice when i jumped in but to be friendly to the guys you know yeah. i showed the uh have you seen the one finger trumpet player have you seen that one yeah i saw that one. yeah have you seen it have you seen that well, well, go ahead. it kind of breaks the ice you know it's a plastic trumpet <laughs> That's I, awesome. show you that I just loved it. But anyway, and then you go like, hello, hello. Oh, must be a deaf mute. You know, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, try to you just just to try to break the ice amongst the trumpet set and then you know, but you can tell if they're they're like huh, they shouldn't have brought you in. Uh, they didn't need to bring a lead trumpet player in, you know. I, I I'm I'm the lead trumpet player in this town, you know. Or, yeah. or they, you can tell the attitude of different people, you know. Just so, it's all a matter of style. Let me let me ask you a question. And all of us, everybody on this forum, everybody uh, watching on Facebook Live, which there I don't there are so many. Well, you are in a demographic that is very very competitive, and it's very, you deal with a lot of strong personalities. And one of the things I, well, you're just a beautiful human being. I think that's why you were very successful in what you were doing. I mean, it, you know, on top of all the pl great playing you do, but let me ask you, how did you deal with a lot of those strong personalities sitting next to them, uh, you know, and having to bite your tongue, you know, because it, it's it, at the end of the day, it's about music and it's about, you know, doing your job. I like, well, how did you... well I mean, uh, Tommy Shepard used to say, he said, you got to be nice to everybody because you don't know you might be working for the guy next week, you know, right. <laughs> and uh, I think you just have to uh, play the right note at the right time and try to get along with everybody. That's right. the right attitude. Just, you know, nobody, because it's, you know, how long you're going to see them, you know, you just see them and, you know, it's just a matter of style. People have, they approach people with different style, you know, and like I just showed you, I try to break the ice with a little joke about the one figure trumpet player, the mute, or something, you know, just just something to break the ice. And, uh, and, and you know, all the trumpet players, like Warren Looney, used to tell a lot of jokes. Yeah. You know? Gosh, and, uh, he, and he, um, so I, I got, and I'm going to get to the questions in a little bit here. Um, what would you, first of all, you know, we, we talked, when we were, we were hanging out, you were talking about how the studio, the studio work is a pie that's diminishing. And it's it's getting smaller by the day, by the month, you know. And uh, you know, what would you say to say a student or the, the kid in college who wants to do what you have done? And um, like what would you say to them at, at this point? Like, what are some of the words of advice you would give to a student I, right now? I'd say don't be discouraged because the the music business is always changing. And you know, now now look at look at these things that are virtual ensemble like your thing and like what we're doing the online lessons i gave a lesson yesterday to a guy in israel you know it's it's just amazing what what we can do now and we have to adjust to the times you know it's not going to ever return to the house bands in las vegas because they discovered that they don't need that you know they just bring in self-contained action and, and you have to adjust to the times and be innovative and don't get discouraged by the fact that it's not the way it was it's the way it's going to be, and you create that, and just innovative ways like you're you're you doing that uh, night in Tunisia, and stuff like that. That's that's the future. That that's part of. It. I mean, this is the future. Yeah, and you got to be on top of it and be creative. 
Now, Walt, again, and I'm, 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 I'm actually getting to some of the questions here. Uh, so I got, I got a question. Have you ever had bad chop days or, or, or periods of, ch of times where your chops weren't doing what they're supposed to, and you get frustrated and you want to quit? What would you yeah, say? But most, most of the time it's been from not practicing, okay. you know, or not practicing right, you know, rushing it, you know, trying to force practice, but but if you practice every day the way I, I am now, it your chops just get better. They right. and they, they seem to they've gotten better. My my uh, upper range has gotten better through the years and just but uh, uh, no, it's just something keeps you going. And there, you know, I always say that trumpet is like a car that yeah. doesn't start the same. You know, some days it's hard to start, some days it starts right up, and other days it runs fine, and other days it just Oh, man, you have to push the accelerator all the way to the floor. You know, it's just, it's, that's the way Trump it is, uh, just the nature of it. No. it. And it's because of your muscles or the food you eat or the air currents or something. <laughs> <laughs> so, Walt, if you don't mind, and again, I, I hope, uh, can I keep you maybe an extra 10 minutes? Is that cool? Oh, well, okay. I, I, I want to get some, some of the questions, sure. Yeah, that's where I'm going to right now. Okay. Okay, yeah. uh, Walt, um, Mike Downing from Arizona asks you, have you ever worked with Urin Rossi? Urine, who, who? Urine, um, Mike Downing from Arizona says, have you ever worked with Euron Rossi? I hope I pronounced his name right. I, I, is he, uh, where is he? Studio trumpet player out of Los Angeles, Urin Rossi? No, I have not. No. You never worked with him? Okay. No. Um, second uh, is from Mark Schwartz. Uh, he asks, he says, hi, Walt. What I've always enjoyed is that you, as a lead player, you have always been consistent. Whenever you come to the same passage, you always phrase exactly the same way, same attack, release, dynamics, effects, etc. How did you learn to do that so well? Well, you know, you music, like I said, it's a language. You, you speak it, and it's just how you you see you get a vocabulary. Ba, ba, da, ba, ba. It played one way, or a guy could play it. Da, 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 da. It's just an attitude that you have. Um, toward that figure and uh, I don't know I just I look at a figure and I just hear it a certain way according to what the rhythm section is or just um, suitable to the music style yeah I, okay I got another question here and again I apologize to pronouncing uh, Mr. Racy Racy uh, you're on Racy that was his name uh, oh you on you on yeah. yeah did you ever work with him Oh sure, yeah. I went fishing with him. Can you tell us about him? Yo, you want? Yeah, yeah. He was. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I showed up for that that family, the, there was a, a a TV film called Family. Yeah. And, and it had a nice flugelhorn solo on the main title, and I'm sure that they wanted you on to play it. Yeah. You know, but when I got to the session, you on is sitting there. And he puts it on my stand, and I said, "Oh no, man, here you go." And he no, and he played, and and I, it's it's a real pretty thing that uh, the, the and uh, you know it was one real nice of him to do that. But he was very humble. Hey, one time, you know, he was he had polio, you know, and he he was on, you know, uh, crutches. Yeah. But uh, my son and I were out in a fishing boat with you on one time, and he got a leak in his boat. We got a a leak and we had to call mayday and we had to get be towed in <laughs> and we were scared i was we were scared yeah oh wow so and i heard he was a peach of a guy too that oh was, yeah the problem with him he had a bad attitude that was his bad problem right. that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that, yo yuan was the, yeah. the same so yeah. i i have another question and this is from paul uh he asked who is your biggest influence while working in la who was the guy you really like, you know, influenced you as far as working working in LA, Los Angeles. Well, I think Chuck Finley is just this much better than every trumpet player there is. <laughs> He's amazing. Yeah, he just yeah. is, and uh, and of course Malcolm McNabb um, and and uh, Warren Looney. Yeah, Warren Looney just he just played good. You know, he could just play everything, play yeah. good and played in tune and. Any funny guy, just really nice, sweetheart, play good jazz. Yeah. So no, all those those people and 
it's something when you're with good players, it makes you play good. You know, right. everybody knows that, you know, so you have to either, and they notice right away if you're, if you don't fit in, if you're a square peg in a round hole, you know. Oh, wow. So, they know. yeah. And then um, I've noticed a lot of, um, I, I've heard you say this, and I've heard a lot of the, the studio guys say this, that, you know, it's, when you're there, you just let your plane do the talking for you. And that's it. You know, uh, you, you know, you don't play anything that's not written. You just let your plane do the talking. Right. And, and well, uh, that's true. You know, the politicking, let your politicking be through the horn. That's what I always say. With what comes out of the horn, that's what they, that's what they want to hear. You know, all the rest is just uh, noise. <laughs> noise. And, um, Oh, I got another, I got, I got a whole bunch of questions. So bear with me. Okay. Uh, I got a uh, Jack. Uh, he, uh, I don't, he doesn't say where he's from. Jack's asking me this question. I'm going from Facebook to the, so uh, he says, can you please ask Walt, what was his most, what's the hardest chart he's ever played and why? Well, the, uh, that Hey Herbie uh, tune that I wrote on my first album, yeah. was incredibly hard it's like b flat a flat b flat you know but uh um there's been a lot of different hard ones you know it's been 50 years yeah you know? well uh, it's hard to say but that definitely that hey herbie was the hardest thing i can recall ever playing i remember at the end he wanted me to do but a little, little he wanted me to like take it up and i was like i couldn't play anymore it's like no <laughs> It was hey, I remember the feeling, you know. Yeah. Here's uh 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 Jason. Jason's asked, can you talk can you talk to us? Can you sorry, can you tell us about uh working with the Chase band on Watch Closely Now and what that was like for you? Well, when I showed up, you know, they uh Alan Ware got me the gig because he was a Vegas trumpet player and I was playing around Vegas at that time. I had time off. Uh and when I showed up. The, the band that was, uh, they were all the original guys. And I, I didn't know any of them except Alan. And it was kind of, they treated me like, oh, are you the screech player? You know, and I, <laughs> uh, well, yeah, uh, you know. And then the first figure, we, we start rehearsing and the first figure is the first one on the album. It's got a, a chart called Watch, Watch Closely Now. Yeah. It starts on a, a B natural on the staff. Ba -ba 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 -da 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 up to a high A. Yeah. And the first, the first, I had my chops were up, and I, I, I nailed it the first time. And they were like, "Hey, man, where are you from?" <laughs> <laughs> like, and they, they, they welcomed me. But they, they all, it was a when we started playing the four trumpets, started playing in, in harmony just by ourselves. That ring, that beautiful harmony ring, I can't describe it any. Just like the beautiful harmony chords, those guys were really followed me and they they respected me and it was it turned out to be a uh, obviously great great uh record yeah if you guys don't have that album go pick it up watch closely now it's uh it's the chase uh tribute album it's a great album uh yeah um well, another question brandon from florida he's asking uh can you talk about the low gear high gear is it a different embouchure what is that exactly yeah it's it's i change i just change the uh my position on my bottom lip, top lip. It's just the uh, bring the bottom lip in, and it. And, but I wrote a couple of books about it. Um, let me see. I got them right here. Hey, did you see, can you see my little dogs? Oh yeah. <laughs> that's that's Minnie and Mickey. <laughs> anyway, this is. Uh, the, the new one, uh, Low Gear, High Gear. And this is the first one I wrote in 1980 called uh, Double High C in 10 Minutes. And uh, both, full, both full of exercises that help you with that change in embouchure. But I swear that has helped me in my career absolutely immensely. Uh, Dr. Lou says, that's really interesting. It sounds a lot like a Baroque embouchure. Is that what you would? Yeah, I'm not sure if it's broke, but it. it yeah. I noticed that when I play piccolo trumpet, I use it. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and both of those are available through Q Press. I'll put a link in the description. I can put. Thank um, you. Yes, it is. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Um, Great. And so uh, I got another question. <laughs> this is a good one. 
This is a really good one. Okay, it says, uh, this is from Mike. Mike's asking, uh, Walt, well, what is one of the, what are what what are the two what are the okay I'm, there's some misspelled words here but okay what are the two things you think every trumpet player should have as far as um, equipment or I guess I, I would just say let's go with the equipment uh, sure I uh, let me ask him to be a little more specific go ahead well you need a yeah you need a flugel and a, you need a trumpet stand I guess. <laughs> 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 well, let me ask you this. Like you, you talked about the perfect trumpet player. Okay. Um, in your, in your eyes, in your opinion, what is your opinion? What would a, what would a professional trumpet player, what should they, I guess, what, what skills should they have as far to call themselves a pro in your eyes? What would that? Well, I think be? number one, I say read, you'd have to read to, uh, you know, if there's a job that you need to read, of course, you'd have to read and, you know, play the right note at the right time. Right, but I'm that, saying, like, be a very good reader. Be a, yeah. I mean, like, like, yeah, okay. Yeah, be able to, to read stuff and then interpret, you know, interpret what the music is by, you know, if it's, uh, if it's a march, get into it, play the march. If it's jazz, kind of play in that style or mariachi, play in that style. You know, you'd be a musical chameleon, I, right. I think. And, and that's what, if you want the most of it, but you gotta be a jack of all, master of a few. You, you know, wanna be, you know, yeah. you wanna be, be able to be, you can't be a master of all, yeah. but you know, like I think Arturo, he can do a lot of things, but I don't think he's does everything. I mean, I, I, we could find one thing he doesn't do, but not very many, you know? but he's, right. yeah, yeah. yeah, he can do it all, but. All right. But, uh, you know, then there's always somebody that does something better. That's why when I'm in a section, and I've been in a lot of sections where, like, you know, Carl Saunders or, uh, you know, somebody sitting right next to me that plays great jazz, I'm yeah. not going to play the jazz. I'm going to pass it to them. Yeah. You know? that you pay, you, you, it's a team work, work. You're in a team. A section is a team, and you want to play, play the, the game right, and you want it to sound the best out front, so you give it to who you want. You know, I, I like what uh, George Graham used to tell me about Bobby Shue. He says, he's never going to pass you anything you sound good on. <laughs> and you know what? I think you told me this too. He said, a, a great studio player has a flexible wrist. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Lead trumpet, no, three, lead trumpet's all on the wrist. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, and so uh, if you don't mind, uh, again, I, I hate to keep, can I keep you like 10 more minutes? I got a bunch yeah. of questions here. Yeah. Um, okay. I got... Um, here is uh, Don. Don is asking, okay, so you, you worked with Elvis in Las Vegas. How long were you on the band? Well, uh, from 74 to 77, okay. you know, and we, we were uh, the first part, when I first joined, I was uh, split lead. And then like for the last year, uh, Pat Houston. So from 76 th through 77, I was his lead trumpet player, which paid more and we got a, I got a private room. We, oh, nice, nice. Yeah. <laughs> That's really cool. All right. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, I got another one from uh, Jeff. Jeff is asking, uh, what equipment do you use and what would you recommend uh, someone who's looking for the right equipment? How would you go about finding the right equipment that works for you? The, uh, I, now, the one I definitely recommend is the Bach commercial trumpet. It's it's it just for 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 the kind of playing I do, and for that that sound, you know that Conrad Gazzo lead sound or Maynard stuff, and but uh, I've played the same mouthpiece for fifty years, so you have to find something that's just comfortable. I when Dominic Calicchio made that mouthpiece for me, he said it was semi round, semi flat, semi shallow, semi deep. He, it was semi everything, so yeah. kind of a middle of the road mouthpiece, twenty six hole. And so you just have to find the one that works best for you. Can you, you tell learn it. it doesn't learn you. <laughs> Can you tell us the story? I mean, a lot of people need to hear the story. Can you tell us your Dominic Calicchio story? Oh, Dominic. Yeah. He, uh, he, he made me a flugelhorn because I, I had a piccolo Dominic Calicchio piccolo and a Dominic Trump trumpet. And I wanted a uh, flugel to match. And he, he made me one and it was a cornet with a flugel bell on it. 
Yeah. So, you know, and it was out of tune. Uh, the guys in Vegas were and Vic Damone show were like making fun of me, like they, hey man, get a real one, you know. Yeah. I could I couldn't really tune it up. So I took it back to Dominic and I said, Kate, can you fix this? Oh yes, I fix, I fix it. And I call him every uh every couple of weeks. Hey, did you got that flugelhorn? Ah oh, yes, I working now. I working now. <laughs> well, you're working on the flugel? Yes, I working now. I, I, so three months went by. I finally I come down and I I said, hey, you got the flugelhorn? He was off. Oh, I sold it. I said, who <laughs> bought that? He said, Hugh Massa Kayla bought it. So I said, and he went down, he took me to Stylin Vine and he bought me a, a flugelhorn right now. You know, he bought me right, paid cash for it and bought me. And I, so I had this Getson flugelhorn. I, I later traded that. Anyway, I was working on a Dick Clark salute show. Yeah. And uh, Hugh Massa Kayla was one of the, uh, the guest stars on that show. So I built up the nerve to go up to him and I said, hey, did you buy a flugelhorn from Dominic Cleakey? He goes, oh, yeah. He said, I made a lamp out of that. <laughs> that's, that's what it was. Yeah, that's a story. True story. <laughs> uh, I got another question. I got Brian asking you. Um, uh, are you going to start redoing your cases? And if so, when? Yes, there's a guy in, uh, in North Carolina, Nottingham, um, North Carolina, Brian Curry. He has a, a webpage, Brian Gettisax, and he's developing the cases right now. Uh, we're, you know, we're having the same problem with the fiberglass and the the uh, interiors, but he's 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 been working on it pretty good. So um, we've got some good prototypes, and it should be. Uh, it, well, we'll wait for the quarantine to be over when we see what's happening. But you know. Is, is, there, is there a picture with Maynard dropping one on like on cement floor or something like that? Yeah, or? Ed Sargent took that picture. It's a great picture of uh, Maynard because I, I gave him a case and I said, I'd like a publicity shot of it. And that's what they sent me. Pretty good, huh? Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And uh, I got another question for you. Um, Brian again. Okay. Uh, can you can you talk about your warm up routine? I play uh, I play scales. Charlie Turner sh showed me the the way to to, uh, to warm up. You start on a G above the staff and play down two octaves scales, and then all the way up to high C. Mm -hmm. And then I bring that bottom lip in, and I play just arpeggios. <laughs> I play just to warm up that high gear embouchure, and then just that's a uh, that it's a quick warm up. So, but it's just scales and that high gear thing. Then, then you're like ready to, to play. So, uh, how long is your warm up? I'd say it's about uh, five minutes. Five minutes? Are you good Maybe. to go? Yeah. Just five minutes. Uh, okay. Uh, Tom is asking, how much do you practice your upper register? I incorporate it into the end of, uh, like I'll play an etude and at the end of the etude uh, switch to the high gear. It's almost like pretending you're, you're playing a big band chart and it's got a high F on the end of it and you have to nail it, you know, it, 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 it and I sometimes uh, if I didn't have that, I couldn't, wouldn't be able to play that last note, but yeah, I, I definitely incorporate it in there. Uh, okay. I got um, Jason's asking me, Walt, I see gold records on your wall. Can you tell me what those gold records are for? What albums? Well, there's another one over here, a platinum one. So, oh, <laughs> platinum, yeah, huh? I, I, yeah, well, I'm not even kidding, but yeah, the platinum one is for uh, Lionel Richie's All Night Long. Oh, wow. Da -da 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 -da. And the, this one is for Elvis Presley, um, his concert, in concert album. Oh, wow. And the other one is for Barry Manilow. Uh, a what? What is the? Uh, I played the the piccolo trumpet solo on "Somewhere Down the Road." Da, 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 da. It's funny. Uh, Artie Butler called me on the phone, and he says, "Hey, can you play this and get your piccolo?" And I I played it for him over the phone. And he says, "Okay, come on in." And so we. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. And yeah. so, uh, what was it like working with Barry? I mean, what is he like? Was he there? Is, uh, well, it was Artie Butler was 
the uh, composer that that wrote all those great charts, and then that he was, I did a lot of his sessions. Okay. So that that's why I don't, you know. But I did work him at the uh, at the Greek theater one time. That was really exciting. You know, Barry Manilow. But yeah. um, no, he's he's a gifted entertainer. Yeah, incredible. Well, I mean, he, so you've worked with the best in the business, the best, like the the top guys. Like I can only imagine sitting next to the guys you've sat next to for over 50 years. I mean, are you talking about all these amazing sections you've set? Is there a section that really in your mind, like- I have to say yeah, a couple of them. The one in New York, Greg Disper, Tony Cadillac. Oh, wow. Richie Vitale. And uh, yeah, those guys, man, they just, man. Yeah, Frank Vergara, just good, 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 solid players. And then, uh, Danny Barber in Chicago. Oh yeah, great. great. He yeah. passed away, unfortunately. Passed. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I could leave a lot of people out, but I just you know it's. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm just saying, you know, is there is there a section where everything just went right, or you know, a, a session? Sorry, where you know I've heard this, you know, if so and so, like they say that a lot about Chuck Finley, they said a lot about uh, Rick Baptist, and I'm not trying to drop names, I'm just giving this. Just, if those guys show up, you're you're going to be okay, you know. And, well, you know, yeah, I mean, there's a reason that they're as successful as they are. They uh, they 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 play the right note at the right time, and they they do it right. Yeah. Uh, so, and is there a it, session that sits sits out in your mind that you're like, it was just honestly, there was a lot of them, you know. Yeah. I, and the 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 guys in London, Paul Newton, and Adam Lindsay and Pat White. Those guys in London, when I played, when I went there and played the Elvis thing, it's just, it just, it's so great when, when you, you play a chord and the chord is like perfect, you know, it's like, yeah. wow, you hear it. And, and those guys were, and, and good attitude too. Right. They wouldn't let me pay for my drinks, you know. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. Check me out, Alex. Just a gentleman. And, so there's a saying, and I, I, you know, I've, um, I, I was, uh, I was at Capitol recently, uh, well, last year, and I got to sit in on a session. And you know, the, the the for those of you who haven't sat next to guys like Walter Hill, I mean, there is a reason why you guys get the money you're getting. And there's a reason because, I mean, can you? Exp there's something about you, you know, your your, I guess your. Uh, y players like you when you're sitting i mean sax players when you're at that level i mean like i mean when i sat in this sec i sat in this session and i i heard and i was like that's why they get the money they get is because of the perfection and you talk about the perfection a lot um you know what is it well what did i mean was it just all the the things accumulating you know the vegas the this that or did you when you were in when you're in Los Angeles starting to do studio work, because doing studio and doing live are two different things. Did you have to change some things about your playing when you got to LA? Well, yeah, you, uh, you don't, you don't make any mistakes in the studio. I mean, you do. And, and, and but they, everybody notices, no. you know, when it's live, it's like, eh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it, yeah, it's the concentration though. I mean, concentration like that is very hard to do for that a period of time you know well but that's what i think that's what keeps you attentive to that you know the fact that you don't want to make this mistake you you're basically just thinking i want to get out of here you know? <laughs> <laughs> i want to play this and get out and yeah. get the money get, you know and that's uh that's pretty much what what i used to just uh show up and you know, you've seen a musician salute, haven't you? You know. Uh oh. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so, so what what's in the future for Walt? What what's Walt's future looking like? Right I now? want to go with the flow and and see where the future brings. Uh, my honestly, um, I I inherited the uh, Sinatra eight piece book. I've got. Uh, the and I'm there, I've got a great singer Henry Prego. He lives in Las Vegas, and he's he sounds just like Sinatra. Sounds great. He sounds it looks like Sinatra, and he he's uh, we've already done some gigs, so we're looking to to put that together. It's called the 
Frank Sinatra Alumni Band. And that's what I really want to do. I love that music. To me, that, that is the musical utopia as far as you can get. I mean, I know playing all these other gigs, there's great, great feats in music and lots of fast notes and stuff. But something about the Sinatra era, the, the, the lyrics behind the songs and the, the ingenuity of the charts, it's just, that's, that's where my era is. I, you know, I'm 72 years old. So, you know, it's like, that's, that's where I'm at. And, uh, you know, Walt, well, like I said, man, you're, you're a beautiful human being and an amazing player. And you're, and one of the things you Thank said you. that really stuck in my mind, you know, is that the Walt now can kick the Walt 40 years. He can kick, he, he would kick his butt playing wise. You know, you know, I think, I think my plane has gotten better. Yeah. And uh, it's because I used to just think, oh, I don't need to practice, you know, or, you know, I get home from a five hour session and, you know, uh, you're, you're so tired, you don't want to practice, but you have to because all you did was sit there the whole time. You know? <laughs> <laughs> With passage sheets, you got paid, but, you know, that's, I know any studio player will tell you that. They, they get, you get home after a six hours session and you have to practice because you didn't play anything all day, but you got paid. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I, I I got one. I got two more questions, and I okay. again I don't mean to keep you. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. Trying to get everybody here. Um, you know, there's a really nice uh, one of the things uh, that that really that, that was really uh, really motive that really motivated me as far as when when uh, we had you guys and I'll put if you guys haven't seen the video, Walt does this thing with Keith Fiala, and it's two schools of music and. It, one of the biggest things that I've heard was that you complimented each other. You had two different styles. You complimented each other. I think a, when you we started this webinar, you talked about the competition. How do you, well, only a true musician can compliment another musician. You know, it's not a contest at that point. You know, I mean, you're both accomplished players. You both have resumes. You know, let, can you... When you like when you go into a session and you know you're you're doing something with another trumpet player and it's kind of a solo thing, how do you like how do you compliment the other guy or what mindset do you have? You know what I mean? Um, well, it takes it takes encouragement. Yeah. I mean, who who uh, who of us doesn't like a compliment? Yeah. You know, after you played, who of us? I mean, uh, I used to. Uh, I have to admit to you, I looked for a compliment when I was back with Cy Zender. I every. Every night somebody would say, yeah, man, you sound good. Or just all you need is a little tap on the leg or something just to give somebody, because it's, you need that confidence, you know, and, and, yeah. it, and encouragement is worth a lot. It goes a long way. Right. And uh, um, yeah, no, we're not, you just naturally compete. You know, it's just a natural thing, but it's a matter of style. Like I say, how you handle it. I, I uh, used to observe how guys would handle it. Some guys have a good style. Some guys are a little more aggressive. Yeah. Okay. I got one last question. Uh, okay. This is all right. This is kind of broken English, but I'm going to do my best. Okay. This is uh, Steve. Steve is asking this question to you. Uh, he's saying, well, what would you recommend someone who's getting back into playing do to get back to get better? What would you recommend what are the steps I need to take to get to be a better player after taking so many years off? It's uh, definitely, it's just like weightlifting. You know, you start with small weights and, you know, just play and then rest, play, right. rest, and then play again and rest. But it's, it, you're going to have to start by that play and rest to get the muscles back, just like you get, you know, like lifting weights. Then you can get up to 10 pounds and get 20 pounds. Then you'll be able to, eventually do it but it takes takes time don't do too much or you get a setback okay. don't do do too much at once play soft because that's better than playing loud right um uh okay i think that's the end of the questions and uh again walt i apologize for keeping you 20 minutes over i'm sorry my friend well i hope i hope it's you know it helps somebody out you know i i've uh it's funny you get to a certain age where you know, people are capping you. You know, I just uh, we just did a uh, a video just now um, of uh, Maynard Ferguson. It's going to be released tomorrow on his birthday, 
yeah. for Frank, Frank Bardaro's band. And Frank called me and he says, you know that B flat you hit on the end? He says, well, I hit an E flat above you. And I thought, he says, is that okay? I, yeah, that's okay. What, I mean, you know, I, I used to be the capper. Now I'm the cappy. The cappy. <laughs> <laughs> or the cap, the capped. I did yeah. cap. You but know, you know, but, it, and, and, yeah. and even on the end of Night Tunisia, I hit a B natural and Keith hits a, a, a D sharp or something and it sounds great. And what, I mean, what, uh, am I supposed to be like, hey man, what are you doing? No, <laughs> I think that's great. I, yeah. I, at this point in my life, I, I welcome all the young players and I, I think that high notes are important. They have their place, yeah. but you keep them in your back pocket until they're appropriate. So if somebody wants them, they'll ask you to play them and that's the right time. So right. my that's lesson. Right. That's right. That's awesome. Uh, you know, I can't thank you enough, uh, Walt, for yeah, doing this. Thank you. Our- thank you. Well, let's and, do it again. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, you're, like I said, I say this before, guys like you are living libraries. And uh, we will never, you know, I will never know what it's like to sit you know, in the Elvis chair or the Sinatra chair because those times are before me. But I'm glad that there's guys like you that could, um, you know, tell us what it was like to be in those situations. And, you know, so, you know, I know that, you know, that we all, you know, we all have the same fear sometimes, you know, that I'm just not the only one, uh, you know, on a live gig. But, uh, you know, Walt, again, thank you so much. Uh, it, Again, uh, Walt, guys, if you want to get his book, Low Gear, High Gear, and uh, Double High C in, in 10 minutes, uh, go to Q Press, and uh, I'll put a link down in the description uh, below. And then, uh, Walt, would you Appreciate like it. would you like to say anything else, man? Would you like to any Well, I, I, I was encouraged the other day when I gave that lesson to the guy in, in, uh, in Israel. He was, he caught on to the, the method, and he was able to hit, as some guy in your, um, that seminar that I did at your place that uh, the guy was able to hit a C sharp above double C and he was like wow that's interesting yeah. <laughs> and so no I think it's a, it's a valid method to be taught so I might start giving online lessons I think why not yeah g- guys hit Wald up on Facebook and uh, you know he's you know he'll friend you and then connect with them there if you need help connecting with Walt you can go ahead and uh, you know send me a personal message or through virtual trumpet on and and also um yeah again uh guys thank you so much walt again you're, you're amazing thank you. and thank you for everything thank you. you've done for thank you. beautiful all right appreciate all right. it i will right, we'll see you guys later okay bye-bye